people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say, that's the bad guy. start with this it was announced earlier today in reference to the queensbury versus matchroom five for five which divisions what weight classes will be involved in the tournament the first is heavyweight the second is featherweight the third is middleweight the fourth is light heavyweight and the fifth is heavyweight again which has already given rise to speculation as to what contests involving what fighters we're going to be seeing in these divisions Folkseo Pats says Wilder versus Zhang Hergovic versus Dubois those are the two heavyweight contests Craig Richards versus Zach Parker that will be at light heavyweight Ammo Williams versus Hamza Shiraz yes. that will be the middleweight contest and the featherweight contest could be Raymond Ford versus Nick Ball. It's an educated guess. In addition to this news, His Excellency Turkey Al Sheikh has revealed that he wants to stage a huge show at Wembley Stadium in September, similar to the Queensbury versus Matchroom 5 for 5 in June. I'm talking, thinking, and studying with Frank Warren and Eddie Hearn to do something huge in Wembley in September oh. as a commercial for Riyadh season. That's the one. The one I mentioned in my previous video that could take place in the UK, the ideal environment for what could be a featherweight contest between their Valkyries, their female fighters, Sky Nicholson and Raven Chapman. By that time, Sky Nicholson may have already become WBC featherweight champion, making such a fight a title fight. Her fight for the newly vacated WBC title with Sarah Mahfoud is right around the corner. It's conceivable that Raven Chapman may see action sometime in early summer, some point in the summer months in what could be a tick-over fight en route to this, this potentiality. But that's not all. It would seem that this pairing between Eddie Hearn and Frank Warren is not exclusive to this tournament or these tournaments as bitter rivals Eddie Hearn and Frank Warren are on the verge of joining forces. A broadcast deal is being discussed between Frank Warren's Queensbury promotion in the zone that may pave the way for a closer relationship with Eddie Hearn's matchroom. Frank Warren's Queensbury Promotions is in talks with DAZN over the sale of international rights in what could be a first step towards uniting British boxing's two biggest promoters under the same broadcast banner. The Sunday Times understands talks between Queensbury and DAZN over the rights for certain international territories have advanced in recent weeks and could start to be concluded from as early as next month. TNT Sports, formerly known as BT Sport, holds the exclusive rights to Warren's shows in the UK, but is expected DAZN could make a play for them once they become available. That wouldn't be good for Sky Sports and Boxer. If and when the time comes and Queensbury's engagement with TNT is at an end, if they join forces with DAZN, that's gonna make Ben Shalom and Sky Sports' job a lot harder. The potential union would also ensure Tyson Fury, the star of Queensbury Stable, and Anthony Joshua, who is promoted by Eddie Hearn's Matchroom, are aligned to the same network, alleviating one of the stumbling blocks in negotiations for their long-awaited bout. Queensbury and DAZN did not comment when approached by the Sunday Times. DAZN, the streaming service founded in 2015, has been intent on establishing itself as a global presence in live sport and has been particularly aggressive in boxing. It has a strong foothold in Saudi Arabia, including international rights to the Saudi Pro League football competition, and was the lead worldwide broadcaster on fights involving Joshua and Fury in Riyadh over the past year. So much for DAZN going broke, right. DAZN going bankrupt. I told you at the start, I told you from the very beginning. DAZN was ahead of the curve. 
And so was I. But when is that not the case? <laughs> uh. Negotiations between Queensbury and DeZone are further evidence of boxing's shifting landscape and the newfound peace between Warren and Hearn. Matchroom struck a five-year rights deal with DeZone in 2021 after deciding to leave Sky Sports and Joshua subsequently became a shareholder and special advisor to the broadcaster's board. He's not just... A boxer. How many times have I told you that? He's not the story. Frank Warren pairing up with the zone. That's the story. It was then almost unthinkable that Hearn and Warren could work together, work in tandem. The pair had famously never spoken directly during their years' bitter rivalry. But Saudi Arabia's riches have brought the promoters together, and they have recently collaborated on several shows. The migration of major British boxing bouts to Riyadh has also resulted in more agreements between rival broadcasters with the zone sub-licensing rights to TNT Sports, Box Office, and Sky Sports Box Office for the undisputed heavyweight title bout between Fury and Usyk. Sky Sports had been the dominant force in British boxing before Hearn's departure in 2021. However, its commitment to the sport beyond such showpiece fights in the long term remains somewhat uncertain, with senior figures within its boxing operation fearful the broadcaster could pull out of the sport if it is deemed more hassle than it's worth. There was a time when many a Tyson Fury fan, in the name of Frank Warren, in the name of Queensbury, would belittle and downplay DeZone's global reach. Saying the same kind of stuff you hear Leonard Ellaby say. Dead zone this, it's just an app that. People who don't know the ball from the bounce. Story time is told is that if you can't beat him, join him. And that's what Frank Warren appears to be doing. It's smart of him. If only Al Heyman had the same kind of know-how that Frank Warren has. You know, he had that opportunity last year. When it was officially announced that Showtime would be leaving the sport of boxing and they were in the market for a new broadcast partner, the people at the zone expressed an interest in picking them up, but Al Heyman was not interested. So here we are. And there it is. As it pertains to Ben Shalom, as it pertains to Boxer, Sky signed a four-year contract with Boxer. The promotional outfit co-founded by Ben Shalom in June of 2021 worth 36 million and is currently deciding whether or not to extend that contract. You see the string of fights that Boxer has put together, and it's a good string of fights if I'm being honest. They've put together Frazier Clark versus Fabio Wortley. They're in the process of putting together Joshua Buatzi versus Anthony Yard, a rematch between Richard Riakpour and Chris Billum Smith. But will that be enough to keep Sky Sports in boxing? Sources have claimed executives at Sky were concerned by the quality of its output in autumn of last year, and a recent Sunday Times investigation into Boxer and in particular, its connection to the convicted cricket spot fixer, Mazar Maji, led to conversations between the promoter and broadcaster. What happens if Sky decides not to renew? Maybe Boxer jumps into bed with DAZN too, and maybe DAZN becomes the authority in British boxing. The home of British boxing is nobody else out there would be able to compete, not with Eddie and Frank and potentially Ben. It's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is that Boxer could be dissolved and all those fighters dispersed. So maybe between Frank and Eddie in that scenario, they'd pick up the ones they think they can use and bring them over to the DAZN platform. Maybe it goes down that way. A third scenario. If and when Frank Warren's deal with TNT is up and they're in the market for a new broadcaster, say that Frank and Queensbury go to DAZN, maybe Boxer can then go to TNT. If TNT wants to stay in boxing. Struck me as strange that Boxer sold the U.S. rights to their fights to Peacock, NBC's streaming platform. They didn't go to ESPN. They didn't go to DAZN. They sold the U.S. rights to Peacock that doesn't even normally show boxing matches. If it were part of something bigger, I could understand. In addition to, perhaps, fights that are happening in America, you'd also have some British fights you could watch, though by itself, it seems like an oddity. The future of Boxer and Sky Sports is uncertain. But this, this pairing between Frank and Eddie and DAZN, it makes Ben's job a lot harder. As it pertains to Ben Shalom and a fight they're trying to make, Joshua Buatzi versus Anthony Yard is now. 
very close, according to Ben Shalom. We've agreed terms, we're ready to go, we're just waiting for the other side. But I'm hopeful this will be resolved soon and we can get it on. Frank Warren said, everybody wants it. One side has agreed to terms and the other is still negotiating. I'm hoping that we can get it done. It's a fight that everybody wants to see. This could be big in the United Kingdom. Big enough to be billed as a pay-per-view on UK soil. But the last time I broached this subject, I told you, Ben Shalom has to do everything he can do to get Anthony Yard to come over. Because if he doesn't and Anthony walks, Anthony's got options that Joshua Buatzi doesn't have. And we just talked about some of them. The Match Room versus Queensbury show. He can always fight Callum Smith. Craig Richards. Can always make money in Saudi if the people at Boxer don't make it happen. And if it does happen? Well, Joshua Buatzi's got the amateur pedigree, the amateur background that Anthony Yard doesn't have. The problem is, this ain't the Ammies. This is the pros. And in the pros, Anthony's got more experience. For me and my money, he's got more experience, arguably better experience than Joshua Buatzi. You learn more in defeat than you do in victory. Don't count his three losses against him. Yeah, even though he lost to Lyndon Arthur, he avenged the loss by knocking him out. Even though he lost to Sergey Kovalev and Artur Betterbe, those are champions. The level of fighter that Joshua Buatzi isn't and hasn't proven to be in spite of his amateur pedigree. It was always thought that Joshua Buatzi would end up fighting for a title before Anthony. As it stands, that didn't happen. Because Joshua Buatzi ran from his title shot, whereas Anthony Yard ran to his two times. So if you put them in the ring with each other, what happens? I feel like Anthony's proved he's got more dog in him than Joshua Buatzi. And that matters. Joshua Buatzi is best described as a finesse fighting kind of fighter. His best range is long range when he can get full extension on the punch. His best punches are his straight punches. He can work a bit mid-range to inside, but I wouldn't call him a mid-range to inside fighter. Most of the time, he's trying to manage the distance long range with his jab, and I feel he's a more economic fighter in a round than Anthony Yard is. So where Joshua Buatzi looks to be more of a long range fighter, Anthony's a mid-range fighter. Mid-range to inside, a hooker, a body puncher, those are his best punches, his bent arm punches, and he's strong. We know he's strong. I think strong enough that he could hurt Joshua Buatzi. He could knock him out. It's not a prediction. I haven't made one yet, but I do feel he packs enough punch that he could rattle Joshua Buatzi's cage more than anyone has so far, because in spite of his amateur pedigree, Joshua Buatzi's opponents have been pedestrian at best. He's coming off that win, that points decision win over Dan Aziz. And Dan is a good solid fighter, God bless him, but he's domestic level. Just being honest. Joshua Buatzi's a bronze medalist. He medaled in the Olympics. You would have thought he'd be further along by now, and he's no spring chicken. I think he's in his early 30s. Some unanswered questions. He hasn't really been in there with a puncher yet. He hasn't been chin checked, so there's that to consider, as well as his engine, his gas tank. I've always suspected that a big part of the reason Joshua Buatzi's so economic and around is because he ain't got the engine for a fast-paced fight. I don't think he does, and if you force him to fight, if you force him to work, he could tire, he could gas out. So the question is... Do you think that Joshua Buatzi can manage the distance and keep Anthony Yard at arm's length for 36 minutes? Minutes, or do you think Anthony can crash the pocket, get inside, and bust up Joshua Buatzi? They're both strong punchers. I don't think there's a dramatic difference in terms of power. However, I do think Anthony has more power than Joshua Buatzi. Not dramatically more, but still more. Enough you could say that Joshua Buatzi is more the boxer and Anthony Yard is more the puncher. So who do you like? Joshua Buatzi, for me and my money, has been mostly underwhelming, though I don't know if that's enough that I should count him out. This is a step up in class for him. Whereas Anthony, Anthony's been in there with better, more proven fighters than Joshua Buatzi, but they've beaten him. They've knocked him out. Joshua Buatzi do that. I don't know, that's why we watch the fights, to find out. They've got to make this one. So we can get some answers. I'll get on with Dillian. I mean, Dillian didn't really show me any loyalty when he fought Tyson Fury. You know, we never had a contract. He didn't have to. But he chose really to not have us there by his side. And I feel like that was a, a, a mistake by them because I don't think they really knew what they were doing in a fight of that magnitude. In fact, when he walked out that night, I looked at him as if to think, you know, I think we could have been an asset around him that night. But they didn't want to pay us the money 
Is that a Dillian decision yeah, then? I mean, ultimately, Dillian's the fighter, but he's got people around him and we, we get on. Do you know what I mean? There's no beef, yeah. but he didn't want to pay us the commission, even though we'd invested in all these fights for him. So, yeah. you know, loyalty works both ways. Yeah. And he wasn't under contract to us. And in fact, when we made the Anthony Joshua fight, he was speaking to everybody. He just got offered the best offer by us, so he just chose to go with us. I like people who go, do you know what? Matram and Eddie Hearn have done me right. They're the best in the game. I trust them. And they always pay me the most they can, and they always pay me on time. And they don't lie to me. I ain't going nowhere else. When I hear, I'm talking to them, I'm talking to them. Doesn't mean we're not going to do business again. But my heart is not in it anymore. Do you know what I mean? When you have my back, and you believe in us, I will never let you down, ever. Something to be said about loyalty or the lack thereof, not just Dillian's, but say Ebony Bridges or Nina Hughes. She just left Matchroom. So did Jessica McCaskill. So did Joshua Buatzi and Lawrence O'Coley. Well over a year ago, they decided to go to Boxer. There's something to be said about loyalty or the lack thereof. Was Matchroom not doing right by these fighters? Or is it that these fighters are just ungrateful, disloyal? Does that apply to Dillian? Dillian White's anti-doping fiasco ahead of what was the Oscar Rivas fight Matchroom stood by him throughout that whole thing. They stood by him. His more recent anti-doping fiasco, ahead of what was supposed to be the Anthony Joshua rematch. That by itself is reason enough for them to wash their hands of him. They don't have to do business with him anymore. One anti-doping fiasco, you know, that happens, but two. There's a lofty explanation for the whole thing that Dillian White ingested a banned substance that was not listed in the ingredients of some supplements that he was taking. That's the explanation. You don't have to believe him but that's what the story is he's done a lot of business with matchroom over the years they always had a good working relationship but they weren't necessarily bosom buddies the best of friends i feel like dillian always resented that anthony joshua was their golden child their golden goose he didn't want to play second fiddle to that guy but what do you expect if not that if nothing else dillian would always do what he felt was best for him. You think about that and you think of the state of affairs in UK boxing right now, the Matchroom versus Queensbury show we talked about, and how any one of those slots could go to Dillian, if not for the show in June, the one in September. They could. They could use him. Or they could let any one of those slots go to their unbeaten up-and-comer from Australia, Justice Hooney. They do have one or two heavyweights they're invested in. These fighters that have severed ties to Matchroom, in some instances unamicably, things haven't really worked out for them. I mean, look at Lauren Socoli. Jessica McCaskill may end up losing her belt to Lauren Price. Nina Hughes may end up losing her belt to Shernika Johnson. Kind of get the sense that Ebony Bridges wants to jump ship. She'd like to leave Matchroom. For the fighters that already did, we've yet to see whether or not leaving Matchroom was a wise decision. Dillian wasn't ever really with them, though. They never really had him under contract. All the more reason to say that they treated him well for a fighter that wasn't one of their fighters, for a fighter they didn't have have under contract. And how did he return the favor? So maybe they do a little bit more business with him moving forward, or maybe they don't. We'll see what happens next.